Hi, this is Christian Bush, author of The Serendipity Mindset. And today on the show, we'll talk about three things. One, how my two brushes with death made it clear to me that life is all about the unexpected and what we do with it. And we'll talk about how you can use that to your advantage. Two, we talk about the serendipity of secret introverts and what we can learn from them, especially when you're introverts. And three, we'll talk about how love, and in my case, babies, come from the most unexpected of places. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Now, we're all familiar with um, Seneca's quote, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. You know that one, right? Think about that for a minute. It's known as Sagittarius A. It's an object that's about 40 million miles across and a staggering 4 million times the mass of our sun. What is it? It's a giant black hole just discovered in the center of our galaxy. A Dutch German professor said, luckily, it's at a distance of 26,000 light years away from Earth. Luckily. But what is luck? You know, there's a reasonable assumption that talent, skill, mental toughness, hard work, um, tenacity, optimism, growth mindset, emotional intelligence, all things that determine success and how we distribute resources. But we tend to give out resources to those who have had success in the past, and we tend to ignore those who have been unsuccessful. And therefore, assuming that successful will be, will be the most competent. So is success does success give you luck or does luck give you success you see is that assumption correct you see in recent years a number of studies and books including uh those from risk analysts like nasim taleb have suggested that luck and opportunity may play a far greater role than we have ever realized even if you don't believe in luck and i'm not a big fan of luck i'll tell you you have no doubt had moments that seemed to have a certain, shall we say, serendipity. I'm curious, have you ever considered that you may be able to manufacture that serendipity or that there may actually be a science behind it? Well, stay tuned because that's actually where we're going on the next two episodes. As always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please go over to wherever it is that you tune into our podcast from and do us a favor rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We always need your help. And if you are a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way, in case you're curious, I know you are, I'm Dove Barron and I'm your host. And I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. We've all met people who seem to have horseshoes inserted in their rectums. They are the people who things just go right for. Are they favored by the gods or could there be a science behind their luck? Well, you might be surprised. Let's find out because in our next two episodes, we're going to be chatting with the fabulous Dr. Christian Bush. Now, Dr. Christian Bush is one of the world's leading experts in the area of innovation, purpose-driven leadership, and serendipity. In fact, he's the best-selling author of the book, The Serendipity Mindset, The Art and Science of Creating Good Luck. Christian is also, uh, also teaches at the London School of Economics. He's a co-founder of Leaders on Purpose and the Sandbox Network. He's a former director of LSE, LSE's uh, Innovation Lab. His work has been featured in by outlets like Strategic Management Journal, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, 
the Guardian, Washington Post, and of course on the BBC. He is a member of the World Economic Forum, Expert Forum, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is a multi TEDx speaker and on the Thinkers 50 radar list of the 30 thinkers most likely to shape the future. So that's a bit of a resume. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome author of The Serendipity Mindset, Dr. Christian Bush. Thanks so much, Thank you so much, you. It's great to have you, mate. I've been looking forward to this very much. Now, uh, you know, you and I, we were sort of put onto the same stage a while back. That's how we met. Um, and for the, those of you who don't know, Christian and I met through an event where we shared a platform. It was a Hong Kong event uh, where we were guiding leaders from around the world. And guiding leaders around the world, in the context of that, in the context of leadership development, what's one of the most frustrating things? Because you and I are brought in to guide leaders that seems glaringly obvious to you, but oftentimes it's missed or dismissed by others, particularly those who are bringing us in. What would, what's the thing that bugs you? What's missed that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of times, you know, people in companies try to minimize risk, right? They try to, to minimize the impact of the unexpected because they want to have control. They want to have authority. They want to know what's happening, right? It's a very natural trait. Me as a German, mm -hmm. I relate to that, right? We grow up with this idea, <laughs> control as much as we can, make strategy, have a plan for the next 50 years and, and then, you know, and then die. But obviously that's not how the world works, <laughs> right? Yes. That, that's obviously not, not how the world works. The world actually has so many unexpected moments that could be positive, but we tend to not see it because we close our eyes to it. And so, yes. you know, take the example of the, the potato Washing machine we talked about at, at, at our panel, right? Where, you know, that's a company in China called Hired. They produce washing machines, refrigerators, and so on. And they receive calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, Your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is it breaking down? Well, we're trying to uh, wash our potatoes in it, but it doesn't seem to work. So, what would we usually do? We would probably say, Our marketing plan says that you don't wash potatoes in the washing machine. It's about clothes. So, don't wash them. Let's educate the customer about this. This company did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's surprising, that's unexpected, but there's probably a lot of farmers in China who might have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine, which became a product of theirs. The point here is that we can actually incentivize people across the organization to look at the unexpected, not only as a threat, but as a potential opportunity by simple things, right? Asking people in the weekly meeting, what surprised you last week? What it does is it legitimizes the unexpected as a source of potential opportunity. And that goes hand in hand with, of course, a sense of direction, a strategy. But at the beginning, when we do strategy, pricing in the unexpected actually makes us have paradoxically so more control because whenever the unexpected happens, you don't look like someone who's weak. You actually look like someone who has more control because you told people we're all about cultivating that serendipity rather than kind of trying to just ignore it. So, so let's just, let, let's sort of break that down a little bit because I want people to grasp that. There's a lot there and it's really important. So I remember that story very well about, you know, this washing machine in China, people complaining and yeah, I think if that was in America, people would say, well, what the hell are you doing? You're supposed to be washing your socks in there. Why are you washing potatoes in there? It's not our fault. And they would take that unexpected as your problem, not our problem. And in, and this company didn't take it even as a problem. They went, oh, my God, they're telling us something we didn't know. And this is, a, in many ways, the strategy behind this from, from everything I've read in your book and everything else we've talked about is this understanding that the unexpected, we tend to look at that, I mean, I think it's part of the conditioning, we tend to look at the unexpected as, oh my God, like this is a bad thing, COVID, unexpected, terrible thing. It is, but is it something else as well, right? Um, you know, the 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 event happens and is it terrible yes but is there unexpected good results yes if you're looking for them so this company created a washing machine for potatoes that made them a lot more money and made them a lot more successful and i wonder when you told that story my immediate thought was i wonder how many companies we should be saying to you and i you know as, as consultants saying 
go back to your complaints department and ask them about every complaint they've received that wasn't your fault. Everything that you went, well, that's not our fault. Mm -hmm. You know, you burn yourself on the hot coffee, but the bloody coffee's hot. What if, you know, that's your fault, you're an idiot. Or you're washing potatoes, of course the machine breaks down. Instead of, and for me, when you talked about it, I was like, oh my God, that is what serendipity is. It's actually an awareness, a shifting in the mindset, as you say in the book, away from this is a problem to this is an opportunity. And we know that language, take problems and turn them into, but it's kind of like a cliche. You've laid out how to make this into a science. So let's walk a little bit more sort of through that about creating good luck and this science of luck, because I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting observation. And, and Hire actually, uh, the company created a, a mechanism where they use the Internet of Things and, and other kind of data storage uh, ideas to have these unexpected customer complaints pop up. And then everyone within the organization who has access to it can actually jump on it and think, oh, this could be an idea. And then there's an investment committee that invests into it. So I think there is interesting structures we can develop that actually yeah. do exactly what you just mentioned to not kind of outsource it to a couple of customer service people, but to make it at the core of the organization because it's the core of innovation. But to your bigger point, I think that's an interesting question, right? That usually when we think about luck, we think about it as very passive in terms of mm -hmm. luck versus hard work, right? Luck is something that just happens to us, falls in our lap, like being born into a nice family, things like this. And what our work essentially shows is, no, a lot of people worked really hard to have more luck. And so that's really kind of the difference between blind luck, right? That's just the kind of luck we can't influence. That's the kind of being born into a nice family. Great. That's, you know, not much we can do about it. But serendipity, smart luck, that's what we can influence. Take an example. Imagine you are in a coffee shop and you have erratic hand movements like I do. Imagine you spill coffee over someone in the coffee shop and that person looks at you slightly annoyedly, right? They look at you and you can, there's annoyedness, but also you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. Now you have two options, right? Option number one is you just say, I'm so sorry. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with the person? Option number two, you start that conversation that person turns out to become the love of your life, your co-founder, your business partner, you name it. The point is that our reaction to the unexpected, us making the accident meaningful is where a lot of life-changing events happen, but also up to 50% of innovations, inventions, right? From Viagra to penicillin to else, that essentially unexpected moments, it's about us connecting the dots and turning that into something positive. And that's really the, the kind of point, you know, in our research, we, for example, did a study recently with over 40 CEOs of large companies uh, you know, companies like MasterCard, we set them down and we said, what is it that makes you truly successful? And one of the key themes that came out of it is they're extremely good at two things. One is a sense of direction. If you're MasterCard, you're not only a payments company, but you're saying, we want to get 400 million people into the financial system. And that is kind of our North Star now. That makes it easier for people to connect unexpected observations to that broader sense of purpose of where you're going. But at the same time, Here's a strategy, and I'm telling you already now, when we're making the strategy, that I want to adjust that strategy as we go along, as long as it relates to that bigger purpose, because the most interesting innovations will probably emerge because we're dealing with complex issues in the fast-changing world. And so the fascinating thing is that they have that mindset where it's not either control or planning. It's not either uh, the unexpected or planning. It's really saying, no, we plan the unexpected into our strategy. I love that because, you know, you and I talked about this in a previous conversation where this whole world of niche um, and how bloody frustrating it is for people like me who are a polymath and who are very much driven by many things that I, I, I plan for serendipity. I, I understand that every conversation, you and I are on the same platform in Hong Kong, you're based in New York, I'm based in Vancouver, and there's a great serendipity between us as we're talking about meaning as well as much as anything else. And the thing that I really liked about what you spoke about was that, as you just said, you know, a company like MasterCard has a big goal, and this is the general way we're going towards it, but we're wide open to anything you give us that's moving us in that direction 
even if it seems like it doesn't really match because there's a bigger picture here. And it's that, it's, I think that in, the, in a lot of times when we get into niche, and nothing wrong with having your own niche, but when we get into niche, we often limit what comes in. And so we end up in this fixed mindset of saying, well, I don't listen to that. I don't talk to that. And, you know, I only watch Tucker Carlson for my news. Or I only watch, you know, uh, CNN for my news. And I think, like, damn, you're missing so much on any That's side true. of that coin when there's so much more where things come together you would never have thought about. So when I have conversations with people about the changing economy of the world and I bring up things and like, and they go, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, let's talk about the Prussian schooling system. They're like, what's that got to do with it? And I said, well, well, okay, well, let's just talk about then the creation of the Fed on Jekyll Island in, in, in the chain, train at the beginning of the last century. Well, what's that got to do with it? And it's these connections, these dots, as you talk about connecting those dots that makes for such, um, my words, makes for life's deliciousness. It makes, it makes life scrumptious. But that is very much, for me, a philosophy, but you've turned it into a business strategy. And I think that that's what, you know, that's why I wanted to have you on the show, because it's like this thing that we might go, ooh, that's very woo-woo, isn't woo-woo. So walk us through a bit more of that sort of getting into the science and business of it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, to your point, right, what's interesting is take the pandemic as an example, where if you had that kind of fixed mindset where you say, we are a brewery, we will always be a brewery, we're a mid-sized company, our tradition is we're the best brewery, then you don't see the opportunities that might come from losing your customers, the restaurants, right, because they, they close down, you might go bankrupt, right, because you don't open your mind that you could be something else versus if you realize, oh my God, we can use our alcohol to produce hand sanitizer, com uh, hand sanitizer, you become one of the biggest hand sanitizer companies like this because you already have the infrastructure. And so that's actually what happened with, with a couple of, of breweries that turned into hand yes. sanitizer companies. And we see a lot of different examples like this to exactly your point that functional fixedness actually is the guaranteed way uh, to, to non-survival at some point in a fast changing world. But, mm -hmm. but you know, you also made another point uh, just briefly because it's one of my favorite strategies and then I'll dive more into the the signs of it but i think it's something that adds value directly to everyone's life both in a business context and more broadly which is exactly to what you just mentioned is the hook strategy and the hook mm -hmm. strategy is all about saying whenever you introduce yourself whenever you have a conversation you cast a couple of hooks about curiosities you're interested in about themes that you're interested in. i'm interested expanding into poland i'm interested in getting this uh, mindset into curricula things like this and then essentially those curiosities building them into every kind of conversation we have someone who does that really well is uh, ollie barrett he's an entrepreneur in london and if you would ask ollie this dreaded what do you do question right at the conference or wherever he wouldn't just say i'm a technology entrepreneur he would say something like i'm a technology entrepreneur recently started reading into the philosophy of science but what i'm really excited about is playing the piano and so what he's doing here is he gives you three potential hooks where you could be like oh my god such a coincidence we're hosting piano sessions you should stop by and that's where the big business meeting then afterwards happens right because you built that trust or um you know oh my god such a coincidence um my sister is teaching on the philosophy of science you should give a guest lecture long story short we can all reflect on what are some themes we're interested in and then bring them to every conversation and then to your third point you know what's the science behind that kind of serendipity What's interesting is so we studied hundreds and hundreds of examples around the world across very different contexts. I do a lot of work in very resource constrained settings, especially in, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and at the same time work with senior executives around the world. And so from, from all these different examples from around the world, there's a very clear pattern. And the pattern essentially is that there's always the same process that happens when serendipity unfolds, which is there's always some kind of serendipity trigger, right? So it's the kind of mm -hmm. spilled coffee or there's the kind of uh, unexpected hook that is out there that's something that's random in some way for some like for the person that gets it in some way and then you have to do something with it you have to connect the dots to something meaningful you have to start a conversation you have to in the case of viagra realize that if um, participants in an experiment uh, have movement in their trousers because they took some other medication that might not just be bad that might actually be the serendipity trigger for realizing this could be viagra right and so it's mm -hmm. those kind of moments where we have to make the accident meaningful. But then a lot of times, you know, serendipity has a very long incubation time. 
You might yes. kind of meet that person in the coffee shop and have an amazing conversation, but you got to go on a couple of dates, right? It's not enough to just have that one conversation. Same with like when you get a client, right? You got to have these follow-up things. And so the point is that we need that tenacity also. And so when you look at serendipity as a process of spotting and connecting dots, then you can influence that. You can create more dots and you can learn how to connect the dots better. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, and I love that you've made this point about serendipity often has a, a long tail. It's, it's not always quick. I mean, I, we like the idea, but I think it's very magical to think, oh, you know, I spilled coffee on this person and we meet, we sat down for 10 minutes and we decided we're going to be business partners for the rest of our lives. Okay. Does it happen? It does, but yeah, not really what it's about, but the trust that came out of that, but th this piece that I, that I love, and maybe I love it because I'm, I will own that I'm completely biased, mm -hmm. is this idea of the hook strategy. And I want to put that out there for people, because I think that oftentimes in this, again, in this niche mentality, we only talk about this because this is my thing. And if I only talk about this, then they will see that that's where I have value and they will want to come on board or not, as opposed to, well, what are they interested in? What are all the different things that are going on that actually draw them in, that draw them in? I, I've had so many conversations with friends of mine who's, you know, and I've been friends for five, six years and they've, or, or more. And they've said, I never knew you knew about that. And I'm like, wow, I, I can't believe I didn't even mention it, right? And, and found out, oh my God, that's one of your things. I have a very good friend of mine in New York. Um, you know, we meet every other week. We've been friends for years. Um, it took two years for me to find out he, um, his favorite band is, ja is the Jam, right? You may be familiar with Jam because you're German. They were a British punk band, right? Or semi-punk band, right? Um, amazing band. He's a, he's a New Yorker. I'm thinking, you know, you've never heard a British, British punk band, The Jam. I love The Jam. He loves The Jam. It's his favorite band. We throw jam quotes at each other. You know, but who knew? Because it's not his business. It's not where he's from. It doesn't have an automatic as association. And I think that a lot of the time we go into the narrowness of that. We go into the assumptive rather than the explorative like, you know you as you know you can see it over my shoulder right there you know it's all about curiosity and and i think that that's what i loved about this hook strategy it's about really at what i heard in that one you first talked about it was like oh this guy's feeding curiosity i love that and and you know you hit the nail on the head that it's so much about genuine interest also right and just being interested in other people because we focus so much on kind of transactional, I want to pitch this person, I want to, I want to have this from this conversation, and so on. But actually, the really beautiful things emerge once you have that meaningful connection, and then you do the really big things, right? And so it's it's interesting, you know. Um, earlier on, we, we had a conversation with um, you know a gentleman who was co-running one of the biggest accountancy firms in the world, right? Tr the relatively traditional company, and um, he essentially talked about this beautiful thing that they did around related uh, themes, which is essentially that you know, the accountants never really kind of knew how to talk with other people across different departments or even with, with themselves. And so they started kind of casting a couple of hooks like implicitly without knowing it. And then they realized, oh my God, we're interested in the same music. And they formed an orchestra. And, and, wow. and that orchestra, as you can imagine, was the most amazing team building you could do across different areas and across different interests. And so what, what that is, is right in a world where every manager, every senior executive faces the challenge of a siloed organization that you want to bridge. Well, the best way to bridge it is to have people genuinely connect about the things they're excited about rather than trying to push some kind of big thing on them that they don't really want. And so I'm a big fan of really bringing that out, especially to your point, especially with these people we already know, but who might have a very different side with which we might actually connect. Because if I'm a marketing person, I might think, oh, I don't have a lot in common with the accountant, but then I realize, oh my God, we both love playing the guitar. Oh my God, now we actually build trust and that trust translates, right? It translates yeah, into better communication and, and so on. And, but again, that's a really good point for everybody to get. 
and if you're listening to this and you have a pen and for some reason you're taking notes, which I would encourage you to do, underline that, that trust translates. It's part of the psychology of human beings. It, we act, and we often do it falsely and con people use it very well. If I trust you in this, then I can trust you in that. We naturally do it. We naturally do that. So if I suddenly trust you because you play the guitar and I play the guitar, that transfers to, I wonder how I can help you in business because I trust you. Oh, let me introduce you, Christian. He plays guitar. He's a good guy. Who says? But it, it works like that. And this is a really important piece for people to get around trust. Trust, trust transfers over. It translates into other areas. So that's a very meaningful thing here. You know, as we're coming towards the end of the first part of the show here, and we're going to go into the, the second part of this delicious conversation. Um, what was the turning point for you of, you know, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, you were bought, brought up in Germany, your original studies were in, uh, you told me and I've forgotten, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, original UK in Mexico, yeah. Yeah, but you were you were doing business and all those kinds of things. Yeah. What was the turning point for you to go, Serendipity, serendipity is the thing because you know you come from a very sort of analytical background to suddenly go to that yeah well you know it's interesting i mean i, I grew up in heidelberg to your point in germany where yeah like my kind of education was very kind of uh, focused on planning everything i actually was kicked out of school i had a repeat year um uh, I, I i had a relatively reckless lifestyle probably helped the unofficial world record of how many dustbins and fresh cans you can knock over on your way to school when you're driving and then one day I wasn't so lucky anymore. And I crashed into four parked cars, all cars completely destroyed, including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and he was like, oh my God, he's still alive. And you know, this idea that I was supposed to be dead, that stuck with me. And uh, I asked myself all these weird questions. You know, if I would have died, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? And at that point I had mostly depressing answers. And so it took me on this intense search for meaning, trying to figure out, you know, what is life really about? What do I really enjoy doing? And what I realized is what I really enjoy doing is connecting ideas, connecting people, and that spark that comes from that, right? These kind of moments of spark. And so, you know, I started out community builder, entrepreneur, and then later went into academia. And what I found fascinating on this journey is that the most joyful, purpose-driven, successful people around me, they seem to have something in common, which is that they intuitively cultivate serendipity. And so that's what I got really excited about because first I thought, you know, when we were building communities, you would cultivate communities, for example, of, in our case, it was around young innovators from different fields who we would put into a community. And so that was a lot about, you would go to a dinner and every evening you would hear at least four or five, six times, oh my God, such a coincidence, such a coincidence, such a coincidence, such a coincidence. So I got really excited about this idea. Can you accelerate these coincidences? But I first thought, well, that's only my own life. It's just something kind of as a hobby. But then when in my research later on, it popped up everywhere, it was the fascination of saying, wow, Maybe there's a science behind this. Maybe it's not just an art. And so that's kind of really what got me into this to say, for a very long time, it's been something that I do in my day to day, um, something that I've been using in a way to decrease my anxiety of the unexpected, because I was trained to be uh, anxious with the unexpected. But also now the, the, the science shows that actually there is a way to do that. And so that's what, what kind of got me into this. And, and also kind of trying to balance that kind of, yes, we want to strategize. Yes, we want to make sure that we have some kind of plan. But you know what? Sometimes in life, it might just be a curiosity that guides us. It doesn't have to always be an exact plan. And that's fine, too. Sometimes we're just all winging it. And that's OK. And I think that kind of also relieves a little bit the tension, right, that all of us face to kind of make the best out of everything. No, we, we don't always have to. And sometimes the most beautiful things come from, from those other moments. Absolutely. So we're already at the end of part one. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows how, how they can find you before they were just one click away from part two for those of you who are listening. And you can just simply go back to your player and make sure that you click part two of the show of this delicious conversation with Dr. Christian Bush. Um, Christian, could you please tell everybody how they can find out more about you, about the book, and about all your wonderful resources? Because I know there's a lot. Yes, so the, the homepage is www.theserendipitymindset.com. And uh, I'm at Chris Serendip on Twitter. Fabulous. We will make sure that those are posted with any other social media links will be in the show notes for you as you tune into that. And again, we're going to be back in just one click with more of our delicious conversation with Dr. Christian Bush uh, of the Serendipity Mindset. 
Stay curious, my friends. Stay curious, because that is how you tap into the serendipity. We'll be back in just one click.